everybody. It is Horse Center Wednesday night live show. It is me at Julie Ramjeet with my lovely co-host at Swiss Army Sean and Romero Mirage joins us again here tonight. Thank you so much for jumping on with us, Romero. First and foremost, um, we're so glad that you're okay from your spill the other night. Yeah, thank you. That that could have been much worse, but we had to walk away from it with no broken bones, no serious injuries, and I'll be riding on Friday again. So we're, we're back to riding right away. Praise God, because uh, I got a text late. Um, actually, for those of you who don't know, Romero is my cousin by marriage. I guess I'd be like a cousin-in-law, right? Cousin He's yeah. my husband's cousin. So um, his mom called us immediately and said, Romero went down. And uh, we were super worried. That's when we started messaging you. So, so glad that you're okay. Um, talk to us a little bit about the changes between Florida and Naira, right? You made a big move. You went up north, not only from the weather difference, but I'm sure there's a bunch of different changes with the surface, the colony you're involved in, everything. So walk us through that a little bit. Um, how, how has it been so far changing directions with your career? It's been a pretty good move. Um, I've adapted to New York pretty well. And given especially that I was here, um, I, I left here in about March of 2021. But before that, I spent about a, a year in the Northeast region, New York. And then I went to New Jersey for the summer. And then I did New York for a winter as again as well. So it's it's kind of um, come, coming back, readapting. And um, I, I didn't lose a lot of connections with the trainers. I always kept in, in touch and stuff like that. I, I just love New York. Um, I think it's the creme de la creme for racing. It's the premier riding circuit. The the best riders in the country, I believe, are here. It's a lot to learn from them, but it's also becoming a better rider as well and riding with them. You know, once you ride with um, the best of the best, you're going to eventually become and learn learn from them and hopefully become one of them. So that's one of the main reasons for coming here. New York, they have the best horses, big races. So just want to come here. I know it's going to be tough. The riding colony is extremely deep extremely strong you know but just here to work and grind it out and you know go day by day and eventually make my way into becoming one of the top riders in this colony hopefully in the next coming years and you mentioned that you know and I saw you go back and forth a little bit from Gulfstream to New York you were kind of in and out where was it when you're you know when your mind switched and you said okay I just want to go and I want to stay um it was a little bit between like almost at the end of the summer of 2022. And the reason being for that is that um, when I came back to Florida in tw on in March of 2021, it's because um just because of everything that's going on with COVID and my family, there was a lot going on at that time as well. So I came back, spent about a year, year and a half. But the reason being, you know, with Goldstream going to three days of week racing, and it, it's, it's hard to find um, like one of those premier horses in the summer at Goldstream to eventually take you to those big races at like a Breeders' Cup of Kentucky Derby. You can find them there, but it's just so hard to find in Gulfstream in the summer compared to Naira. That's one of the reasons why I want to come here and just make a name for myself, you know, because New York is really looked up to in racing and just become one of the regulars racing, going to three days in the week in the summer at Gulfstream. It's, um, it's not too beneficial, especially when you could only ride at Gulfstream during the summer. It's not like here when you're riding New York. You could probably go to Parks or Delaware or Monmouth. You know, there's so much track surrounding um, New York. But in Florida, it's like it, it's its own track. And I love Gulfstream. My family is in Gulfstream. I, I grew up 10 minutes from Gulfstream. I went to high school 10 minutes from Gulfstream. Gulfstream is where, is my, heart will, where my heart will always be. But it's just tough there. You have really such an amazing crazy. support system when you do go out to Gulfstream. I know anytime I was ever there, you know, even when Andre would ride there, I mean, wow, your mom, your aunt, your uncles, your cousins, your, they're, they're, I mean, it was just, it didn't matter if it was a regular claiming race or a stake race, the support was definitely felt for you all at Gulfstream. So I know, how, how is that for you being there kind of on your own? Um, is it a little different feel when you go to celebrate in the winter circle, huh? Um, yes and no, because it's, it's always a sweet feeling winning for the family. But it's also one of those things where I, I like that I'm here. I'm, I, I like that I'm building a, a career and a, and a base and foundation for myself as well. Given that Rajiv also, he, he left a foundation here in New York where he had tremendous success. And he's been a great mentor for me as well. Even now that I'm here, I could call him any day after any race. And he gives me riding tips. You know, same thing in Florida. I remember when I just started galloping horses. Andre was one of the people that helped me 
teach me how to learn how to gallop horses. You know, I remember when I was getting run off with and he would help me out. I had so much family in Florida that really helped me out. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of both, but I, I, I love being here, you know, setting a new foundation for myself and building it this year. Starting new dreams. Sean, how are you tonight? I'm good. Glad to have Romero back. Glad you're okay. Um, so how do you, so is that what it is? Put your time in and you think, you know, a year or two, you'll start getting those bigger mounts and those better mounts? Is that the um, plan? There is no time frame when I'll get those bigger mounts. It's more of um, goals that you want to hit, like um, different goals that I've set, my agent and I have set, you know, like definitely want to end the year with at least 50 winners with a, a certain amount of first earnings that we want to hit you know we can't in the first year i don't come i don't expect to come here and pick up a, a derby winner or or 10 grade one horses you know i come here and i know that it's going to be tough right away but we're just here for the long run not to try to come here stay for one year and then leave you know the point here is to stay here and build because i i personally know how hard it is you know especially coming in as a journeyman it's not like i come here and i have the bug where people just put me on seven eight horses every single day i know it's going to be tough Right. But so far, it's been pretty well. I rode four Saturday, five Sunday. I won a couple this week, and I a couple seconds and third. So so far, it's been pretty well here. Do you do you ride any different? You know, what's the difference with riding an Aqueduct compared to Gulfstream? Um, I feel like Gulfstream is a bit more speed biased. Um, the length of the stretch at Gulfstream and Aqueduct Aqueduct is a big difference. Uh, Aqueduct stretch is um a lot longer. So you definitely have to be a little bit more patient at Aqueduct, I would say, more than um, Gulfstream. And definitely the cold. It's not, say, riding style, but it's different riding. And grow, I grew up in the sun, so it's different when I go out there and it's 25 degrees in my hands. <laughs> how how are I, you adapting yeah. to that part on its own? <laughs> now, now, now. So at first when I got here, like the first two days when I rode, I was I was like, I was all like um covered up. I, I would... Mm -hmm wear a whole bunch of um thermal clothing and now when it's like 35 degrees everybody else has their head mask on and head oh, mask on it me and uh dylan davis and i are walking out no face mask no everything so i've adapted pretty well now now i'm really adapt um i've really adapted to new york's weather where i really like the, the weather doesn't matter to me anymore i just go out there and ride i have fun it is what it is oh i'm watching your cousin <laughs> coming down the stretch right now Oh, come on, wait a one time on the Come on. So, Romero, I want to I comment on. Uh, Romero's a good luck charm. We, I think Don't we got him on the head nod. I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> We've had second nighters and we just bobbed at the wire. I do not know what happened. And that is how I. Sorry. That was. Well, I'm always rooting for Andre, too. Trust me. I have him saved on my horse races now as one of my favorite riders. I'm always checking in and stuff on him. Listen, it's the reality of the game. I cannot. Pretend that I'm not paying attention to my yeah. husband, you know. Well, the, best, the best part is one night, we, one night we ended, and Julie and I were talking, and all of a sudden there was a race, and she was doing all that, and I'm like, man, we should have been live for that because she was just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've kept it censored. I think we might have got out. Not as a photo finish. Well, I'll keep you posted, but Romero must be good luck. So that was awesome. We started out <laughs> my game. Anyway, we have some comments already coming in, Terry. He's always wanting everybody at Golden Gates. He said the winners are much less severe. And then we have Jody. Just a little right. bit. Yeah, just a little bit. And then Jody Wright Alvarez, great kid with a great heart. I've known Jody since I was like five years old as well. A lot of people in racing, like even Lescano the other day, he told me, he's like, oh, I remember when you were like three years old and you're a little chunky kid. A lot of people didn't expect for you to become a jockey. <laughs> yeah. Nobody expected for me to become a jockey. And yeah, I remember that. I re I was, you know, I was living in Florida when you were going, when you had made the decision to be a jockey and when you were, um, I remember the transition. I remember the kid, the chubby kid and the soccer and everything. And I, man, yeah. you, you committed. And I mean, look at you now. That's pretty incredible. And we got beat on the Bob. Oh, that's. <laughs> that's okay. What a game race. So that had to be entertaining for the so, viewer. <laughs> we bring that up a lot too. Is a weight an issue for you? Now, no, not anymore. Like, so what helped me get down my weight was um, my last season of soccer. It was it was actually a, a bit of a funny season because I started the season pretty decent in soccer. I tried out for an academy in which the coach at the time, I was about 145, 150, time, uh, 150 pounds. <laughs> so when I made the team, he told me that if I wanted to be the captain, you know, you have to 
you know, be a little bit more in shape. So I eventually got down to about 125 pounds. I became the captain of the team. And then we actually got off to a great start on the team. We became one of the top teams in Florida, top teams in the nation, actually, where the same about in February, March of 2017, I was supposed to go to Mexico to go have a trial for a professional team over there. And I didn't end up going because I just said, you know, what, I'm not even going to play soccer. I want to start riding. Like, I want to start getting into racing again. So that's kind of how that went, where I was supposed to be a soccer player, but then I just completely dropped it and transitioned back into racing. Do you still yeah, get to was, do that a lot on your free time? Go, you know, play? Yeah, yeah. Whenever I get the chance, I definitely go play, and I can see one thing that I, I still kind of got it. I'm not even going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> that's the way you can, you know, it helps you stay fit and active and – you know, it's you, you kind of benefit your riding can kind of benefit off of all those cool tricks you can do, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, most definitely. I love playing soccer. What made you choose a jockey over soccer? Um, I, I, one of the things that really kind of at that age going to a trial, I just thought about it because when I was getting scouted, it was to go play in either Spain or Mexico. I was 16 at the time. I think the language barrier moving from my family was one thing. But also, I've wanted to be a jockey before I could even walk as well. So that was the main thing that really made me transition from being a soccer player to um, being a jockey as well. And I'm I circle- saw on Equibase, sorry, but did Shamir just ride a race again recently? Shamir? Did I ride see that race? one? Oh, Shamir. <laughs> He's a trainer. He probably had a horse. Okay, wrong. maybe I pulled it up. Maybe that's what came up. Maybe because I was like, wait a minute. I, I didn't see that. I'm sure the family would have had that posted. Because the last time I saw Shamir on a horse was this hilarious video of you all legging him up at the track. Yeah, Shamir, Shamir can't ride a horse. If anything, he's the horse in this case if it brings him up on a <laughs> Oh, I love it. And Jody comes back and says, always very special to me and my husband. Yes, Jose as well. I love Jose. I've known Jose. He call, Growing up, he always called me Gordo when I was growing up because he, oh. he knew me since I was like, since I was a baby as well. I knew Jose when he, he just started riding and when he had the bug, he was riding a lot for my uncle, Uncle Buggy Aubrey. He mm-hmm. was riding a lot in Calder those days. So I yeah. remember those days. We always, we we stay in touch, Jody and I as well. She's always, you know, reaching out to us and we're always rooting her and um, Jose on. We have a question here from Ryan Troy Tripp. What is your preferred style of riding? Being out front, a little off the pace, or coming from far back? Um, For me, it doesn't matter as long as I win. <laughs> it's like <laughs> every race is different, I would say. Um, I, I play the brake and see how the horse is moving comfortably. For, for me, the most important thing is keeping a horse in their comfort zone. You know, if a, if a horse breaks running, I never want to take it away from him. And if a horse breaks and he's trying to get his feet under him, I don't want to overrush him off of his feet because he's definitely not going to have anything to finish with. So getting a horse in their comfort zone is one of the most important things. You can see a lot of top riders do that, like Jose, Irad. Louis, one of my favorites that did that was always Ramon Dominguez. You never see him overrush a horse. You never see him um, strangle a horse either. I, I love the way Ramon rode. And same thing with my cousin, Raj. Raj was always a, a, a great rider, especially on the turf. He was, he was a great, yes, he was a very good rider. And I know that we had initially reached out to see if we could get him to join you. But I know he's super busy doing other business endeavors kind of uh, worldwide, right? He's like in Jamaica starting things up. And I think that's amazing. I love how he's giving back to his country. So you definitely have an idol. But I mean, you ever hear him talk about missing it at all? You think you'll ever see him back in the tack? I'm not sure if we'll see him back in the tack. I think we might. I'm not sure. But he definitely misses it. I know his heart is always with racing, for sure. Yeah, Roger's heart is always with racing. I know that for a fact. For sure. And then we have, let's see, Sean Nolan, a fabulous jockey, but an even better person. Proud to call Romero my friend. Yeah, thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. I got the pleasure of meeting Sean in Canada when I went to the Queen Split in, I think, 2019. I got to meet him. That's so cool. Yeah, that's cool. Take us for our little, you know, let's say, you know, we okay, we're going to be in Naira. You know, you have your goals that you've mapped out for, you know, the year for your career. But what's your what do you, would you think would be the biggest bucket list accomplishment for you as a rider? You know, some people say the Derby, some people say the Breeders' Cup, um, some people say the World Cup. Where would be your kind of aha, I made it moment? Um, that's tough 
because um I don't think one race could define somebody's career. Um it's it's a great accomplishment. Um as a rider, you just want to feel satisfied in yourself that you've made it. I think the best the only way to say that you've made it is to probably win an eclipse award. That's the only way to say that you've fully made it. I, I would say because I mean there's tons of riders that I know personally that are great riders that's never won an eclipse award. So I don't even want to say that as well. Right. I think the biggest race for me would be um definitely a Breeders' Cup, but um mesmerizing moment would definitely be an eclipse award. That's like on a pedestal. Yeah. And I think with the Eclipse Award, like you said, a lot of riders do go unnoticed. You know, yeah. there's a lot of underrated riders that, let's just be real, don't get the attention that some of these other guys get or the opportunities. Um, do you have any cool opportunities coming up that you want to tell us about? Any big horses or that we should keep our eye out for or anything special you you like riding? Um, I have to check the entries for this week because they, they have to come out. But, um, See, I have a couple horses. I, I really like the horse that I fell off on Sunday. On sorry, on Monday. And what I happened? Did he clip heels? Did he what stumble? What happened exactly? It, it was very weird. I think um yeah. he's such a cool horse too. I love that horse. I actually went on him the first time that I rode him. And what happened, I think he broke his first his first stride was great. And then his second stride, I think he was just trying to go too fast from the gate because he's a quick horse and he just lost his footing. But he's such a sweet horse. He's one of the coolest horses to ride. Took him away from the post, um, from the pony in the post parade, and he's just so cool. He's literally like a pony out there. Like he's one of my favorite horses to just sit on. He's so cool. He's a he's a real gentleman. And he came back okay as well. Yeah, he came back okay yeah, as well. I think he grabbed his board a little bit, but nothing major. So Romero, looking at your entries, it looks like Friday you got Sweet Sensation, Sway, Simon DNA. Yes, I don't even know how to. DNA. Wow, I cannot be an announcer at all. <laughs> um, toned up, and then it looks like, uh, what, Monday you're at Parks, too? Yes, I believe it's Monday or Tuesday I am at Parks, riding one for let, Springle. Yeah, let freedom spring. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I have a couple this week, and then I should be riding some on Sunday as well. So, well, but you're riding at Parks. You're awful close to us, so we'll be getting together pretty soon, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. You guys are close to Parks? Yeah, he was named yeah, I'm only, I'm, the other day. I'm only like an hour, 15 minutes away from Park, Jim. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so we're, about, the, we're about three and a half hours. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we're about three yeah. and a half hours. But Andre, yeah, he had a horse up there the other day. The horse ended up scratching, but yeah. Yeah, that's cool. We, we have a comment here from Viren Ramnath. And if I said that wrong, I'm so sorry. He started as a kid playing soccer. Now he's a professional rider. I know it's so cool how fate kind of takes you where you're supposed to be. So talk a little bit. I've seen on Twitter you have something going on with the jockey experience. I am clueless as to exactly what you're doing, but I'm interested. So tell me. <laughs> uh, so, so that's a project that we've been working on now for like nine, ten months. That's really come a long way. It's um, so I could read a little bit of what it is. Like I could. Um, so the Jockey Experience is a Web3 horse racing ecosystem driven by digital assets, right? So digital assets meaning NFT. So a project is um, an NFT project or a project of digital collect collectibles. What depends on what people like to call it, right? Our project is based on seven keys. The seven keys is to bridge, to educate, IRL, which is in real life, charity, community, our gamified lore, and last but not least, longevity, right? So... Our project is bridging horse racing and Web3 together. And the reason why is because horse racing, people in horse racing know, know nothing about Web3. And people in Web3, they probably know of horse racing, but they don't know anything about horse racing. Well, Web3. that's me because I'm like, I'm in horse racing and I'm like, what's Web3? I thought there was only one. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm confused. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Web3 is, uh, is basically like crypto, NFT, okay. decentralization, basically. Right? So, um bridging right the first part is bridging web3 and horse racing in which they have a significant common denominator and that is the misconception that both hold right so when people hear about crypto and nfts a lot of people see in the news like the ftx and all that stuff the, the bad stuff that went down right but it's really educating the public of what web3 can do people don't hear about bitcoin of of how it's up over ten thousand percent in the last 10 years or hear about how ethereum is up 10,000% in the last five years about those things. People want to attack 
um, the problem. The same thing like horse racing, right? People always want to look on the outside and say, oh, there's this that's going on. There's that that's going on. Horse racing is abusive. It's this and it's that. But you and I know and everybody knows that uh, everybody in horse racing knows that horse racing is, what for me, the best sport and the most beautiful sport, right? So that's the thing about educating people, educating the outside public that, listen, there might be bad apples in both industries, but don't let that spoil spoil the bunch. You know, Web3 Absolutely. isn't bad. There might be bad players. It's the same thing with horse racing. You might have bad apples, but don't let that spoil the bunch. You know what I'm saying? Horse racing itself is, for me, the best industry and, the you know, the greatest sport that there is. So with that, um, for holders, we'll be um, – our primary primary target primary target would be on the Web3 side, bridging them into horse racing, meaning if you own an NFT, you'll get access to featured races like the Kentucky Derby, the Breeders' Cup, Pegasus World Cup, come out to those races and stuff like that. And we're also building a community around horse racing as well to let them follow up and, and sorry, my phone rang. Yeah, and to uh, follow up and learn more about the sport, you know, take, take part in activities like We'll be streaming different derby races in our Discord coming up. You know, we're just trying to give back to a community as well as we have our charity wallet in which 5% of proceeds will be going to different charities like the Thoroughbred Aftercare and the PDJF and also like smaller communities, right? So growing up, as you know, I play soccer, but my high school, um, they didn't have too much funding for jerseys, right? So we basically buy the high school jerseys. But in return, what we want to do is go into schools and and teach them about horse racing and about what love that. right we want to go into schools and say hey listen you don't have to get a a, a bag a, a job to just bag groceries at public you can actually go down to the track you could become a teller you could become um a hot walker you could become a groom you could right. become whatever you want to be at the racetrack you know but the younger generation isn't exposed to this right now. absolutely right and that's what we yeah. we speak a lot about that on here and i love to see you know another entity another form of this coming to light because you're right. It's almost hidden. If you're not from the backside, you don't know the backside. Or if you know the track, you might only know the race part, but you don't know how many careers and opportunities there are there full circle. So I think giving back to the schools and bringing that, you know, um, into the youth for real is really, really what this industry needs. Yeah, 100 percent. That's that's one of my biggest things is um, bringing the younger kids into horse racing, showing them the job opportunities that it does provide you know showing them that this globally horse racing generates over 120 billion dollars in revenue every year you know that that's the type of things that we want to bring to light and show people that you don't need to be a, um, a jockey a trainer um an owner to be a part of horse racing you could be a groom you can be somebody like at belmont they have the cross guards for the morning from the horses walk across the road there's so much jobs that the industry provides we want to bring that to light because right now it's foreshadowed, right? So, and one of the biggest things that we've seen is that horse racing 50 years ago was the biggest sport called the sport of kings. What happened when basketball, football, soccer, they were all, all aired on television. Horse racing wasn't aired on television. So that's where horse racing technically was behind exactly. at that point. Right. And another thing that we see now, horse racing used to be the only sport in America that you can bet on. Now there's sports betting. People are betting on other sports so that – takes revenue away from horse racing so what we have to do now is show people what horse racing really is you know show them what the sport is really about get younger people out to the track that's the whole point of it because if the same people keep coming to the track the, the sport isn't going to grow yeah. that that's that's the biggest thing for me that i see is just getting the under 18 crowd to the track getting them involved because one thing that i do see at a lot of racetracks you can have liquor there and you can have gambling there yeah, that's true. That's a great entertainment for the for everybody else that's there. That's great. I'm not saying you shouldn't have that there, but what else is there for the kids? I remember when I was growing up and I went to Calder, you had the arcade with horse racing games. You had pony rides. There's so much things there for kids to do. Now, when you go to different tracks, you don't see a lot of that stuff for kids. No, yeah, right right. Now it's, it's a lot of betting and it's a lot of alcohol. When I grew up here, even the local track, we had Sunday racing and one o'clock post. And I've talked about this before, but it was something for the families to enjoy because it was afternoon racing and everybody would come out and, you know, there would be food cooked outside. And it was just such a it was such a good time. You always wanted to go. They shut that down and they added mm -hmm. Wednesday nights. And it, it's definitely shortened being able to take your family out to enjoy the races here locally you know and, and we run so late 
Um, and it, it is sad. It's it, it. We need more opportunity, and we need to be more welcoming to the to the youth and the young. And I don't gambling. We need it for the purses. You know, we can argue that all day, but there's with that we can absolutely add something for the future, right? Yeah, because you're absolutely that. right. I mean, where's the, where where are those older people going to take us? But but not only that as well, Julie, because if these kids aren't coming out to the track at all and seeing what it's about, they can get caught up in those misconceptions that are spread in the news that horse racing is bad. So once you get them out to the track and they actually see what's going on, they see that horse racing is not abusive. They see what the sport is really about at that point. Because well, a lot like of- you said, There's bad in yeah. every uh, everything that, that we do. And in every it, industry. It gets more attention of the bad. And, and it's because we're not shown like you said, we're not televised daily. Yeah, we have TVG, but I mean, like you can, I can turn on my TV right now. And it's probably a game replay or something, you know, we're not the only attention that this really gets is like the Derby and the big races that are televised and everybody ooze and awes. But um, we do this 365 and I think a lot of people don't know that. So I, I love that. And I'm totally interested in, in educating myself more on the other side of it because I don't know anything about NFT, <laughs> but if it's an investment then it could, you know, I'm, I'm interested. So we have a comment here from Terry Romero is so aware and intelligent concerning the horse racing industry. Very impressive. I agree. Thank I you. love to hear a well-spoken writer. It proves that no, the, the, the saying pinhead is not true. Some of them are very, very smart and educated. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that term's ridiculous, you know. Um, you know, that's part of it, too, though. What we're talking about is fans themselves or even people in horse racing, they'll take pictures of the bad stuff or they'll promote the bad stuff. But when they see something good, they're not taking video and pictures of that and sharing it like they should be. Um, people but, love drama. Yeah. I mean, I think that's human nature. People love yeah. plane crash or car crash. You know, their heads turn. It slows down traffic. I mean – we have sources that will say something about a jockey that's bad and it will get 10 times the likes of I posted about Frankie Pennington taking a kid to the winner circle. That stuff happens. Romero, how many times a day does that happen at the track? Probably at least once a day, right? A kid gets taken to the winner circle. Yeah, and kids get given goggles and stuff like that. Yeah, and you don't I didn't know that. I didn't right. know that. That you stuff know, is not talked about enough. And that's one thing within our project that I told our team because I'm myself and Al were the founders and one thing that we've told our team that we pride ourselves on in the project is that there is enough negativity that in the media about horse racing that one thing in our project will never have anything negative about horse racing. What we're highlighting is the great jobs, the people that are unsung heroes in the, in the sport, and just showing what horse racing can do for the regular person. Because I saw Richard Miglier, he just put out a tweet that he was never in horse racing. He didn't have a background of horse racing, but he's he's now a hall of famer that gets to speak about horse racing on live television, you know, so you don't have to have a background in horse racing to become something in horse racing. Yeah, absolutely. That's a prime example of it. You know, that's what we want to teach the kids. You know, I had a kid last summer, I think his name is Tyler early last year in 2022. He reached out to me on Instagram and I told him what to do, how to get a job at the track. And he told me, he's like, man, thank you. He, I think he got a job hot walking horses at Christoph Lamont's barn. And he told me he, that I was the last person that he could have reached out to because he reached out to so much people and he just didn't get a response, which probably they, they probably didn't even know that they messaged him or whatever the case may be. But right. he's a 17 year old kid that's in high school that wants to get involved in the sport. And also what we need to do is be able to bridge the younger generation into the sport. And I promise you that this sport will just prosper because every other sport, you have a, a ball in the players, you have a ball in the players, you have a ball in the players. But in horse racing, you have the horses. We have a big advantage. We get to work with animals. That's what I tell a lot of people when I speak in Twitter spaces about the project that, you know, I, I, I get to wake up and I get to ride horses. You know, I'm lucky like that. People it's a privilege. And I, it is exactly. a privilege. Exactly. I mean, you have a big advantage yeah, over every other industry. We've got comments coming in. Andre, smart kid. I told you that <laughs> firsthand and he had to throw a little fish emoji in there for you. <laughs> of course, Andre would. Grandma horse racing, listening to jockeys interacting with their fans. Golden. I totally agree. I, I you know, Romero, I had no idea that, you know, I've been seeing the, the stuff, but I really didn't know what you were doing. And I, I totally support it. I think it's amazing. And I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're just trying to build a foundation that's both 
You got to give back. And, you know, giving back is what it is. And I feel like even bringing that energy into your colony, maybe you could inspire other riders to come out of their shell and want to do the same thing in some way. You know, I, yeah. I really love that. Yeah, most definitely. I, I love the project. It's it's crazy how the project just came about on itself. But um, what we're doing and the plans that we have to and to help horse racing, all we're trying to do is benefit both Web3 and horse racing. So I'm, I'm just exciting for what the huge for the future for what the future holds of within our project and both the sport yeah I so see. as you go ahead sorry Joel. so as you have people discover horse racing like what are their first reactions have you gotten them to the track yet like what are their first reactions and their responses to it um they actually love it they, they love um seeing a lot of the videos that the jockey experience page on twitter posts we have a lot of um videos and content that we post about the horses they really love it they're very intrigued by it um, a lot of the fun facts that they just didn't know. And that's one of the things that we're doing is getting people out to the track. We've gotten people um, within Web3 out to the track that has never been to a, a horse race before. We've gotten a couple people out that we've actually spoken to at the track and stuff like that, which is a really cool experience. But I'm just excited for when we could bring like 5,000 people out to the track and really show them what's up and then, you know, hopefully grow the sport. I'm, I I'm love super that. Valid. Yeah, this is exciting. You know that? It's exciting for the industry. You know, that's what we we do that here, trying to highlight, you know, players in the industry, unsung heroes, you know, the, the jobs that people don't get to see. You know, we've been working on that with TikToks and videos and just cool content. But um, I love to see it coming from a different entity. I love it. I just I think we need more of it. And I'm fully supportive. I think that there's so much room to spread the real awareness of what racetrack life is like there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of good people back there yeah a hundred percent i agree and and a lot of people the first thing that they ask ask me is is horse racing abusive and the first thing that i say i say listen i eat um i eat breathe sleep horse racing so everything that i tell you is going to be true and then i go on and tell them why horse racing isn't abusive i go and i tell them that listen every horse before they race every day they have to be examined by a state veterinarian and then at the track, if on the track during races, there's another state veterinarian that's looking at the horses before they go in the gate, or if anything happens. So I'm going to pause you there. Outside. I'm going to pause you there. You know that there's not a state vet at every racetrack across the board, right? Really? There's not, and that's something that we've talked about with other riders on the show, um, and how important it is to them. Um, Terry Houghton, we had on, um, and he brought it up. And actually, a couple of days after the show, he reached out to me and said, I don't know if it was the show or what happened, but I went to work today and we had a vet check. Um, so that's something that with your platform, um, you you know, I, my my voice here, I, I like to spread the thought of raising a standard across the board for horse racing, a, a, a bottom a bottom bare minimum. Right. Whether you go to Naira or you go to Ohio or you go to California, Kentucky, wherever you are. There's no reason why you as a rider or a trainer should chip into a different place to run and not have the same rules or expectations. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. So, you know, this whole HISA thing coming down as a federal thing and trying to tell riders what to do and all this. I think you, we, we, we as horsemen need to counter and say, wait, wh wh where, wh what about the standard of everything that is actually needed? before we get into the little increments of you telling me how to ride or how to medicate or mm -hmm. things like that. So if you're going to bring knowledge, we got to bring truth. We know we don't censor here. We, we have to bring yeah. truth to that. So we, we want to inspire those places to level up and be on the same playing field as everywhere because the horsemen and the horses need it. The horses need it. And yeah. then the jockeys need it because you all don't need the pressure. That's what Terry was talking about, about not feeling it's not right that the jockey would have the pressure of, making sure his horse was sound to run yes a hundred a hundred and fifty percent i agree with that there should be a state vet at every track and with high heisa coming in I, I thought there was a state vet at every track but i guess during, racing, during racing yes and but uh the 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 the, the issue was the pre-race checks but there are certain race tracks horses were not getting pre-race checks the, it was it was basically the vet at the, at the call to post that was their check or you know the, if the rider said something so yeah so that's there's there's a couple little things that with spreading the truth and talking about how great it is that we also need to talk about you know it's 2023 we're evolving and 
there's no more need to just do the bare minimum. We could really be leveling up to make the sport thrive and be what it was, you know, a sport of kings. But in this day and age, to do that in 2023, we have to raise the bar. We have to. We have, we have to. to raise the bar on, on, on just so many basic levels. And it, I feel like it would only benefit everybody involved. And you as a rider, you know, horse, everybody. Yeah, there's there's one million. Um, We have to look at it on both ways, too, because we in horse racing, we need that as well for the riders, for the trainers. We need vets. But there's also a million people out there that's looking at horse racing that wants to see horse racing fail. Right. There, there's people out there and that's the truth yeah. about it. You know, one thing within racing that we need to accept that there are people out there that don't want to see horse racing thrive. So we need to raise raise the standard of ourselves. You know, we need to raise the bar, like you said, and make sure that, you know, there is no room for tiny mistakes like that. You know, we, we really need to raise the standard. I totally and just, agree. I and agree. And, and, I, and I want to make something very clear because I think there's a misconception as being a horseman or being in love with the sport and advocating for the horse. That does not mean, you know, it's like you're not automatically affiliated with PETA. You're not automatically anti-horse racing by saying, hey, we got to step up and do a little better here. Right. Yeah. I feel like you're that is going to do nothing but aid to the sport in, in the future. You might not see that in that small window you're looking at today. But to speak up on what's right doesn't mean you're against anything. It means that you want to see it continue to thrive. I feel like there's a big difference there. And I, a lot of horsemen that I've spoke to, the, the, it's very common I hear people don't speak up because they're afraid it's going to come back on them. Or people won't speak up for change because they're afraid they'll be pushed out or in some way, shape or form. So yeah. I think getting that out of our minds, having more people like you, you know, like me, younger people too, to come in and speak and say, hey, it's okay to accept change and it's okay to level up and change this or this. And that's going to make everything so much better for everybody involved. I feel like that's key. People have to yeah. open their minds a little bit, though, for that to really. And, and sometimes it's not even it's not even changing. It's just evolving. You know, right, evolving. Changing, the sport's changing. The world is changing. <laughs> everything is changing. So it's not, it's sorry, everything is evolving. So we have to evolve as well. We can't stay in the times a hundred years ago, you know, we have to evolve and make sure we grow the sport in the right way. Right. You know, and and it's okay to love the sport and advocate for the sport and the horse. Like it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, I feel like it has to go hand in hand. And and to do that, we have to make sure that we're, we're getting that bare minimum across the board. Yeah. 150%. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing you mentioned is how much money horse racing makes. Don't you think they could, put some more money back to horse racing, especially we talk about mental health. Um, they don't give you guys much, if anything, really, you know what I mean? And and they could definitely fun. help provide some uh, help with you guys. Yeah, um, I think that's a part of it. You know, we just have to see. I, I'm not sure how much profit each tracks make, but there should be definitely more given to jockeys, given that um, especially a, a lot of the, the lower tier tracks, that a lot of riders have to go out there, they have to gallop in the mornings, and then they have to go and ride, and a jock smile is probably not even $100 at some of those tracks. You know, I don't think that's fair. I think jockeys should be earning more, especially then, especially sometimes the, the, the jockey standings are a lot, are very top-heavy, meaning it's a lot of the same three jockeys winning a lot of the races, and then you have the first place jockey getting 10%, and then the second and third, they're getting 5%, 5%. You know, I think jockeys should be getting more given that you're out there. And th these are for the tracks that are galloping horses that have jockeys galloping horses. You know, you're out there, you got to gallop horses every morning, and then you have to go and ride. You have to gallop 10 horses in the morning, go ride seven or eight in the afternoon. And then, you know, and then the purses aren't that big on top and of it. And physical strength left to do it because let me tell you, it takes a toll. It takes a toll 100%. And then another thing about that too is just retirement and financial literacy being taught to jockeys of how you can set up your, your um, you know, getting an accountant, how you can set up your 401k, how can you invest? Because a lot of riders, the amount of injuries, I'm, I'm 22 and I've already taken a couple injuries myself. You know, imagine a, a lot of riders don't want to ride past their 35 until they're 40. You, you could look at a lot of NBA players, soccer players, after they hit 32, 33, a lot of people are saying, oh, they need to retire, they need to retire. And I'm out here riding with a lot of jockeys that are three, four times my age and you know, they're doing it from paycheck to paycheck, but it's that financial literacy. But not only financial literacy, it's just a pay grade that jockeys make. And one thing that I express to a lot of people that they don't know about, which is why I love being on both the horse racing side and the Web3 side, is that 
you can see both perspectives. When I tell people that jockeys are not on contracts, they're completely mesmerized because when a basketball player gets hurt, they keep getting paid because they're on a contract. When a jockey gets hurt, the moment they fall off the horse and they can't ride the next race, they stop getting paid. That's one of the things that needs to be brought, you know? There has to be more resources implemented for you guys just as a whole. And I feel like that, you know, if they bring in things for you all to fall back on as far as like more, more proper assistance, you know, with, with, with injury, uh, resources for mental health. If somebody needs to talk to somebody or needs an out, cause a lot of these guys have zero family wherever they are and have nobody to lean on. Um, and they're like you said, expected to go to work every day and just grind it out. Um, just proper things like that. I mean, I just think it could be. They, it, it could make a. It could make a heck of a change. It really could. Yeah, most definitely. I. I, I think it can. But sure. in saying that, I don't want to see it just at Gulfstream. I don't want to see it just at Naira. It's you know, I want to see it everywhere. Right. You know, Why are you better at Naira? But if you came somewhere else, you're not as valuable. That's my question. Yeah, exactly. That's my question. Yes. Yeah. I, so I, you, I some of these smaller places, some of these smaller tracks. Their purses are just as good or damn near close. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of, uh, I, I think um, it's just, um, we're all in horse racing, you know. Right. We're all riding races. We're all jockeys. We're, we're, we're all the same. So I think we should all be treated the same. doesn't matter which track that you're at. You know, okay. we, we should have the same benefits, the same, you know, almost pay grade w- with that. You know, I'm not saying purses. Purses are always going to be different yeah. at different tracks. But when it comes to jocks, mount, and those type of things, you know, I think there definitely needs to be some type of change. Well, I think that you will be one of the guys to help implement change in this industry. Just hearing, you know, the things I'm that you're saying tonight, I keep speaking on it. We, we need it. And, um, you know, keep involving the youth and just don't be afraid to speak up for what's right. You know, even if you love the sport, sometimes you got to stand on things that are a little uncomfortable. And um, I think with someone like you, you're, you're very intelligent. I think that you could add a lot of good things to this game. And the Thank you, um, for sure. Thank for you. Sure. Thank you we have one more comment in from Grandma Horse Racing. These are your athletes' horses, which we all depend on. You're yeah, absolutely 100%. right. And that's that's something that um that I, I love seeing. Um, I'm on TikTok a lot, and I see a lot of off-track thoroughbreds. That's one thing that I love seeing is that we we're helping the horses go into retirement, having a safe and healthy retirement. Because I I see a lot of comments on TikTok as well from other side of the spectrum saying oh they see this horse do this after they're done racing well no most horses have a safe and healthy retirement that's something that i want to highlight that these horses are taken care of to highlight proper placement placement of racing yeah there's a lot they're doing a lot better job because they have these aftercare entities at these tracks now and there's people now that i mean i've seen on overnights (laughs) excuse me if you need help uh rehoming your horse you know call such and such um, where to me, the horse being found in a pipeline of a mess at a slaughterhouse or something, it's inexcusable. Um, it does still happen. I actually just rescued one today. I had a fundraiser going and the horse oh, is not nice. mine, but a West Virginia bred that I love the bloodline and he ran here at Charlestown and, um, it's the sad reality. It's like you said, it's a few bad apples. It is not the whole industry. And exactly. again, it's stepping up and announcing change. Like, hey, we don't we don't tolerate this because we don't need to, yes. right? There's so many so so many good people, um, but I think that it's getting a lot better yeah, uh, for placement of the horses. And 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 now I think having the the if the track and the aftercares can come together and and really draw a firm line on okay, we're here to help you guys if you need help free homing. It gives yes. these people an opportunity to get out if they're in a financial situation. You know what I mean? Without doing something that we wouldn't love it's detrimental yeah we have a comment from anthony i think he's a very well-spoken writer and just needs some great opportunities right. he will get them they're coming thank you peck <laughs> I, I wrote for peck and i finished fourth last time i wrote for him at aqueduct rajiv and tony won a bunch of races for him and i think shamir as well and then we have Sean Nolan, one of the brightest minds in our game. His insights and ideas will bring the sport to great places. Very proud to support in any way I can. Thank and you, then Sean. Grandma Horse Racing, so does Julie. Yes, I'm a huge advocate oh. for the horses. I am just, that's, I, I drive myself crazy because I love them so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all, I think we all do, you know, it's, but 
also saying about the horses, it's the same for the jockeys. If, you know, Romero decided to quit tomorrow and every jockey that's out there right now decided to quit, replacement riders would not be a good idea. Right. <laughs> I don't think you're going to find. Sean, you can take his spot. No, no. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to lose uh, 110 pounds that quick. You know, uh, it would be bad. So I I, 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 t I totally support what you're doing, Romero. I think it's great. And I think, you know, and in, in, in opening up people's minds, you know, just enlighten yourself a little bit to the things that need to be changed and add that to your, you know, your dialogue when you're introducing people. And I think that, yeah, you know, the options are limitless for you. Yeah, most definitely. That's what we're trying to do, just being a bridge between both. I love that. Well, I'm excited. I'm so glad that we had you on. John, do you have anything else for him? Well, yeah, I have one more actually was I'm bringing this up earlier, but now we got to push. When we were talking about the difference between Gulfstream and Aqueduct, I hear all the time and I kind of see it when I'm watching, but don't always see it. Is they're not as aggressive up front at Naira. That even like the other day, Andrew Wolfson on the rail stole one at like 30 to one because he was willing to go to the lead and no other jockey was willing to go to the lead. Do you see that? Um, it just depends on the race and how much speed is in the race as well. You know, you won't, um, for Goldstream, the stretch is a lot shorter. You know, that's why I, I believe that a lot of riders are more aggressive in Goldstream. Aqueduct, the stretch is a lot longer. You know, you, you know, a lot of tracks where you'll see the stretch is a lot shorter, like Charleston, the stretch is so short there. The riders have to be more aggressive because as soon as you hit, hit the, as soon as you straighten up, the wire's right there. For Aqueduct, it's a lot different. You gotta have you you have to have some horse turning for home. You have to save your horse. You can't just um, over rush and then the last quarter of a mile when you turn for home, you have nothing left. So it's a big difference riding here and and with the ride. It is it's a different type of riding and the reason why because the tracks are different and that's that's just how it is. The track is different. It's a it's a longer stretch in Aqueduct, far far longer than Gulf Stream. Surface Another comparison, do you feel a difference? Sorry? Surface comparison, do you feel a difference, like, dirt-wise um, there versus Gulfstream? Yeah, I feel like um, Aqueduct is a bit deeper. And yeah, that's from the winter. That's from the winter. Harder. Yeah, that's from the winter and them having to weather eyes and, and all that, yeah. Yeah, the kickback definitely hits harder. Or it stings yeah. a little more, right? And those balls are frozen, it hurts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you, do you think, too, when we started with this whole whip, whip roll thing, it seems like more front runners do win because it's harder to get a horse to come from behind since you only got those six strikes? Mm, I don't – I'm not too sure. I really haven't noticed that because I've won on a lot of horses coming from off the pace, a lot of horses. So so I think it, it's it's pretty fair. You Was know, that everybody an has for you? Same, sorry? Was it an easy adjustment counting hits or were you – <laughs> nope. Well, for Haisa, no, because the reason why, because before Haisa officially enforced the rule, Goldstream had a six strike rule. Right. Was set. Right. Before Haisa came in, with that six strike rule, I had a couple of fences. But when Haisa <laughs> came in, I was okay. I was already. I was. Already you <laughs> learned to count by then. By the time Haisa, you had you had learned the count. <laughs> yeah, and it's not even counting because. I'm a rider when I'm riding and I'm like, I'm very emotional when I ride. So when I'm riding, I'm just riding to win. So the first time I, I got my offense, I'm like, okay, I, I need to calm down. I need to count. The second time I was like, really? At least I won. <laughs> every time that I got an offense, I won. So it was like, Aww. you know, it was, it was, it was, a little <laughs> so then I learned my lesson. So I was okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then the out. first money starts cutting, right? Yeah. <laughs> when I was high I think I've had one offense, but not zero. So I, I'm, I've been, I've been a good boy. That's good. There you go. You're not on their, you're not on their target at all. So yeah. that's a, that's a good question. Though. If you could change one rule tomorrow, one rule it stays in effect tomorrow and it stays in effect for the future. What's that one rule you would change? Um, this could be anything. It could be the weight. It could be, it could be anything. Jocks amount. I would definitely change the jocks. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I think. If a rider have to go work a couple horses, then you ride them in the afternoon, and sometimes you get even taken off. You know, when you look at it, if you really look at it, you get $100. You can say $100 is the average jock amount across the country, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to pay $25 for IRA deduction. That leaves you with $75. And out of that, you have to pay another $25 to your agent. Now you're at $50. Now you have to pay another 5% to your valet. You're cut down to $45. 
after that, you have to pay taxes. How much money are you really making from a job spot at the end of a day? About eighteen dollars. <laughs> yeah, you're not you're not making much. You know, I'm not laughing, really, but that's the reality. I mean, and, and I'm not saying this for myself, you know, because you know my goal is that to win races, you know, but there's a lot of riders that depend on Jock's Mount that go yes. out and gallop horses that really depend on these Jock's Mount. And then at the end of the day, only be to, to be making let to be making around forty less than fifty dollars for a Jock's Mount that they say is a hundred dollars. That's something I would definitely change, you know. I that, love that. Yeah. Change. And, and most people don't know that. There's people watching the show now that think every jockey is well off and they're going to their hourly job and they're bringing home more money and probably working a lot less than right. a jockey, but they're sitting at home complaining about a jockey because they think this jockey is in a million-dollar house because he's making all this money, and it's it's not true. And I think that that kind of what you're doing, you know, bringing the knowledge to people who don't know what we're doing – you know, is is the same. It's spreading real information and 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 bringing yep. people like this onto the show too. And it gives you know these are real people. We've had some of the quote unquote the best riders in the country come on and say like, hey, if you're not winning, you're running second. Like, you're not. You know, you're not making you're any not money. Making much. Yeah. You're not doing anything. So I actually, Willie, Willie, Willie Martinez said the best thing I had heard uh, about that. He said. He, it was such a humbling experience for him when he was at the top of his game and he was winning left and right. He said a fan approached him and said, hey, man, you ever been in the Kentucky Derby? And he said, yeah. And the fans, oh, you must have made so much money. And he said in that moment, it hit me. He said, I ran like last. Yeah, I guess, you know, he was like, I only made $100. <laughs> like, you know, he was like, it made me realize like I wasn't nothing. And yeah. I think that's the misconception, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, you're out there on TV competing in. The Kentucky Derby for a hundred dollars. You're not getting paid to be on TV, no. right? And you're not getting an extra check to be televised and be on people's screens. So, yeah, I think that's it's a double-edged sword. But with people like you and people like me and some other great people in the industry and what we got going on here at HRT and what you've got building with Jockey, I think that you know a lot of good things are, are in the future for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you. Well, I am wrapping it up. It, we've had you on for an hour. I told you 45 minutes. We'd cap. I lied. Right. <laughs> I'll take a few minutes out for my antics and theatrics for watching Andre. But let me get off here before the next race comes on, and I look more like a fool. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I will be following. Um, definitely going to have Andre reach out because there's no reason why we can't get together now that you're closer to us. And um Maybe we can get together and you can educate me a little bit on how I can get some Bitcoins. Oh, yeah, most definitely, for sure. <laughs> cool. John, you got anything else? No, that's it. Glad to talk to Romero again. We'll definitely be in touch. And then if I ever am in parks while you're at parks, we'll definitely meet up. Yeah, for sure. Just let me know. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, cool. One question. Are you going to Saratoga? We plan on it. My agent and I, we plan on it. Okay, cool. Maybe we'll come visit you up there. That's, that's everybody tells me I need to come to Saratoga. It's such a fun place. Okay. <laughs> I haven't been yet, but I'm coming. <laughs> All right, guy. Well, have a great evening, and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. That was awesome. What a great way to end out the week for Horse Center. Yeah, absolutely. He's that always fun. Great. Yeah, he's great. Very well spoken. I love everything he's got going on. Oh, we have a comment coming from Terry. Willie, Jamie, Rich, and Sean, you're doing a great job promoting and educating the public concerning the horse racing industry. Great guest interviews. Love grandma horse racing involvement also. Yes, we love Terry. We love Rich. We love everybody. We love grandma horse racing. And I've also been trying to let the um, comments hang up a little bit longer so people can read them. I was told that I was flashing them too quick. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, what do we got coming up? You want to let people know what's on the roster for next week? Um, yeah, next week. So where are we at here? All right. Next week, we got trainer Tim Ham on Monday. Tuesday, we got another trainer, Chasey Devell Palmer. And then Wednesday, we got jockey Mikel Michelle. So okay. another exciting week. All, all first-time guests, too. So. Awesome. And Jamie will be back in the saddle tomorrow or next week. Sorry, she'll be back hosting with you. And then I will return the following week and we'll be at it again. Yeah. But, when um, you come back the following week, you'll be here three straight weeks. Three yeah. straight weeks. She does it to me every time. 
we have some really great guests coming up some really really cool shows we're working on lots of really really great content coming and educational pieces so make sure you're staying followed up with us follow us on tiktok twitter instagram um give us a like a share whatever you can do we appreciate it um tell your friend to tell a friend and that takes us wire to wire absolutely and you and everybody else hopefully my husband in the winter circle tonight yeah in the winter circle yes okay. in the winter circle. yeah <laughs>